I'd like to talk about this weirdest topic, which is cheese. At the University of Michigan, anybody been there? Uh, 2015, researchers did a survey of 384 people and they asked them this question. Which foods cause you problems? And, and by problems, what I mean is you have trouble cutting down, you can't control how much you eat, and it turned out that the fifth most problematic food was ice cream. No big surprise, right? Um, the fourth one was cookies. The third one was chips, the second one was chocolate, but the first one was pizza. <laughs> and I'm going to say it's not the sun-dried tomatoes. <laughs> it's not the olives, it's not even the crust. There's something about that half inch of yellow asphalt all over the top <laughs> that makes pizza this addictive food that people just lose track of. And so the fact of the matter is people love cheese. But it just doesn't love you back, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, let me start with this. What causes weight problems? You know, if you talk to people about weight problems, Carolyn, you see people in the office, and they, and they all bring in this idea that I got heavy from eating sugar, right? You hear this, right? It's too much soda. Kids have too much. And, and, and soda is not health food. However, I am going to put a question mark. Is that the reason fueling the obesity epidemic? And here's why I say that. It was 1999 when soda consumption started to fall quite precipitously. And in fact, sugar consumption in general started to fall. And that's because bottled water came in in such a big way that it started pushing the sodas off the shelf. But here's cheese. Up and up and up and up and up. Um, the average American consumes 30, in, in 2017, it's, we're now up to 35 pounds of cheese. That's 65,000 calories worth of cheese the average American eats every single year. Okay, now this is very important. This is going to be on the test. Um, <laughs> where are the calories in food? So, so all, everybody who's worried about sugar, and again, I'm not saying sugar is health food, but a gram of sugar has four calories. A gram of fat has nine calories. Is that familiar? Okay, well, wait a minute. Are we, are we clear? A gram of sugar has four calories. A gram of fat, any kind of fat, no matter what kind it is, has nine calories. So if I have the leanest beef, it's about 29% fat. The leanest chicken, about 23. Fish vary, some are lower, some are higher. But all these plant foods are really low in fat. That's why they're really low in calories. Where's cheese? Is it more like beef or is it more like the broccoli? What would you say? Okay. Typical cheeses are 70% Fat. That's right. It's mostly saturated fat. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. This is what people are eating. Um, and, and now you can get sweet things that have no calories at all. There is Coke Zero, but there is no Cheddar Zero. I have to tell you, there just isn't, okay? So it's all got a lot of calories. The second thing is their beans have fiber and vegetables have fiber. And the cool thing about fiber is it, it's a boring word. Don't go to sleep. It's, but it, it fills you up and it has effectively no calories. So when you're eating fruits and vegetables and beans and grains, you get fiber, and that's part of why you push away from the table a little sooner. So there is a little bit of fiber in beans and broccoli and apples and oranges and bananas and brown rice, but cheese is not a plant. It doesn't have any fiber at all, zero. Okay, how about sodium? The reason we're concerned about sodium isn't just blood pressure. You know sodium raises blood pressure, right? But also, sodium me means that you're going to retain water weight. So if you have a lot of salt in your diet, you can retain a couple of pounds of, of water weight and feel kind of blobby. So an orange has a milligram of sodium, an apple has two, broccoli, uh, brown rice has about 20, potato has 13, and potato chips. 330. Well, where is cheese in this? Is it more like an orange? Is it more like potato chips? Well, cheddar has 350 and Edom has 500 and Velveeta has 800 milligrams of sodium in one single two ounce serving. Am I cheering you up? Okay, um, so at the Adventist Health Study, researchers have studied Seventh-day Adventists and the, and the reason researchers key into this population is because by church teachings, they are supposed to be non-smoking, non-drinking, moderate living, health conscious, people. And part of that is you, you should be a vegetarian. You should follow a vegetarian diet. 
But not all Adventists do that part of it. So it sets up a great natural experiment of health conscious non-smokers who follow different diets. So the um, American Diabetes Association published these data in 2009, almost 61,000 people. And they're all following their version of the diet. But are you familiar with body mass index? Okay, you know, it's your weight, but it's adjusted for how tall you are. And it should be below 25 for good health. And so over on the left, the red line there, those are the meat eaters, the non-vegetarians, and their BMI is not under 25, it's 28.8. So your average meat-eating adult is overweight. Now the next line, this is the person who says, I have meat but just in moderation, less than once a week, semi-vegetarian. A little bit skinnier, but not a lot. And then pesco, pesco vegetarian, pesco is? Okay, fish, but no other meat. Um, a little slimmer, but not dramatically so. And then ovo-lacto-vegetarian, ovo meaning? Eggs, lacto, milk, okay. All right, so you have eggs, milk, uh, cheese, so forth, but you don't have the fish or meat. Uh, but who's that blue line there? I have to explain to my patients that a, a vegan is not somebody from the planet Vegas, okay? <laughs> but they happen to be the only group that's smack in the middle of the healthy weight range. So, let's focus in on these last two groups. I am gonna say that the difference between an ovo-lacto and a vegan is really the cheese and the dairy get, that gets thrown in there, right? Does that make sense? And if you do the math, that works out to be about 15 pounds different. So the, the average ovo-lacto-vegetarian weighs about 15 pounds more than their vegan friend who keeps encouraging them to get rid of the Velveeta. All right. So what is cheese anyway? Well, let's go to Thoreau's, Wisconsin. And the milk truck arrives early in the morning, and they pour it in this kind of waiting pool thing. And then they put in bacteria to ferment it. What bacteria do they use? Between your toes, there, <laughs> there, are, there are species of bacteria called Brevi bacteria, B-R-E-V-I. Did you have a college roommate who didn't wash for like an extra long period of time? And you would say, what is that? What is that smell? That smell is the fermentation product of Brevi bacteria working on the dead skin between his toes and kind of fermenting it. You've had dinner already, right? Okay, so if I'm gonna make my Limburger or my Munster extra pungent, what am I gonna use? They don't use something like Brevi bacteria. That's exactly what they do use, it's Brevi bacteria. And if it smells like stinky feet, that's not a coincidence. Okay, so in go the bacteria, and then I'm going to add rennet. What's rennet? Anybody know what rennet is? It, it's an enzyme, right? Where does it come from? It comes from the fourth stomach of a slaughtered calf. And now people will say, I'm not going to eat that. That's horrible. And uh, it may cheer you up to know that most cheese factories don't use that. They use instead a rennet that is genetically engineered but they don't write that on the label because they know nobody would buy it anymore, but that's what they're, they're either using the one from a calf or they're using the genetically engineered one. So in it goes, that coagulates the solid and then the liquid, which is whey, all drains off and down it goes and you're left with this solid stuff that we call cheese. And then you have to stop the bacterial action from going too far, so you throw salt all over the top of it. And that's why it ends up really high in fat because you're concentrating the fat, high in protein, high in cholesterol, high in salt, okay? Can you get hooked on cheese? You ever know anybody who was? Maybe you were? Okay, first of all, it's salty. Secondly, it's greasy. And we love greasy, salty things like onion rings, french fries, potato chips, but it's not just the greasy, salty part, there's something else. Have you heard of casomorphins, casein, Casein is the milk protein. And all proteins are like strings of beads. And each bead is an amino acid. And when proteins are digested in your intestinal tract, those beads come apart and they're absorbed into your bloodstream. And that's true for other proteins except for casein. With casein, what happens is these things called casein-derived morphine-like compounds, casomorphins, come apart, and they look like this. There are these little strings of four or five or six or seven amino acids in length. And they 
go to the brain and they attach to the very same receptor that heroin, morphine, Demerol, or other narcotics would attach to. Why? Why would milk have an opiate in it? Well, what we believe is happening is, well, if a calf did not like nursing, and the calf says, Mom, I'm going to go wander into the woods. I'll be back Thursday. Um, the calf is not going to do very well. Or have you ever looked at the face of a human baby when they're breastfeeding? They have this look of tremendous intensity and focus. And then suddenly they collapse into the deepest sleep. And we think, isn't that beautiful? The mother-infant bond is this wonderful thing. I hate to tell you, you just drugged the kid. Casomorphins are part of the mother-infant bond that make the child want to nurse. So, so, so when, when breast milk is made for any species, there's protein, there's cholesterol, there's various hormones and sodium and so forth, but there's a little bit of feel-good that goes to the baby's brain. So I take milk, which has traces of it, but I turn it into cheese, and I'm concentrating the casein, I'm concentrating the casomorphins. Cheese is dairy crack. The most concentrated form of casomorphins you can get in any food. Okay, so this is the most powerful one. Uh, this is morphoseptin. Uh, it's not super powerful. It has about one-tenth the brain binding power compared to pure pharmacy-grade morphine. So it's not quite enough to get you arrested, but it's just enough for you to say, that was nice. <laughs> Do we have some more cheese in the fridge for tomorrow? I couldn't possibly give up cheese. I could be vegan except for cheese. You've heard people say that. Okay. The government is well aware of this. And so the US government has been working with the dairy industry to take advantage of this exact property. And in the year 2000, the US government held, in cooperation with Dairy Management Inc., something called the Cheese Forum. And I want to show you some slides. These are not my slides. These are US government slides that I got through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the government separated Americans into two groups the cheese enhancers sprinkle a little cheese on their salad. Not interested in those people. The cheese cravers open up the refrigerator door, grab a chunk of cheese and stuff it in their mouth. That's the group we want because they can be pushed to double or triple or quadruple their cheese intake. How do we do it? Well, first of all, our goal is to trigger cheese craving. And again, these are not my slides. The US government set out to trigger disordered eating, cheese craving, and what they did was not unleash a whole bunch of advertisements encouraging people to eat cheese. What they did is they worked with Wendy's, the fast food chain, uh, and I can show you the contract. They developed a burger called the Cheddar Lovers Bacon Cheeseburger as a test to see what would happen. And the beauty of working with Wendy's is if one corporate decision can affect every community where there's a Wendy's, no matter what city or state you're in. And it sold two and a quarter million pounds of cheese. That's good. So based on that success, they worked with Subway, which had two sandwiches that didn't have cheese on it. They fixed that. They worked with Pizza Hut to put an entire pound of cheese on one serving, uh, the ultimate cheese pizza. They worked with Burger King. They worked with Taco Bell. So that as you're going through the drive-through, you don't know this is a contract with the government. Welcome to Taco Bell. Would you like to try one of our quesadillas today? These were government programs designed specifically to promote American agriculture, specifically cheese. Up it went. Um, this has been very, very, very successful. So could that hurt me? Well, I want to introduce you. This is Catherine, Catherine Lawrence. Uh, she grew up in Louisiana, and Catherine was an aeros Space engineer for the Air Force. She was one of the first people to go into Iraq in 2003 um, because she designed military bases. And if you're in a war zone and you're working hard, you don't gain weight. And if you eat what the government gives you, you you're going to be skinny. However, her tour of duty came to an end and she went back home to Louisiana. And when she got there, her friend said, welcome home, Catherine. Let's go out and eat. And what foods did you miss the most while you were over there? And she said, well, I really missed those mac and cheese dinners and, and it, kind of anything with cheese in it. So a friend gave her an entire case 
of mac and cheese dinners, which she ate, it's 48 of them, she ate them every day for 48 days straight. She gained weight, um, but she also developed some pain in her abdomen. And the pain started getting worse and worse and worse, and, and it went with her cycle. It would really get bad, and then it would get a little bit better, and then it would get bad, but as time went on, it was getting intolerable. And she went to the doctor who did a laparoscopy. You put a little incision in the abdomen, look inside with a scope. The doctor said, you've got endometriosis. This is a condition where cells from the uterus creep out and start implanting all around the abdomen. And it causes pain, it can cause infertility, and the treatment is you get your uterus removed. Um, she said, well, I'm not sure that I want to do that because I'd like to raise a family. Um, but she and her husband talked about this and they decided to try medical treatments which were not working. And there were days she couldn't function at all. And she finally said, okay, I'll just, I'll just have the hysterectomy. That'll be it. They, planned, they scheduled it. But before she could have the operation, a friend said to her, you know, foods affect hormones. Why don't you try a completely plant-based diet, vegan diet, no animal products at all. Keep the oils low, see what happens. And she did. And she felt remarkably good very fast. She started losing weight and her energy got better, but her pain started to diminish bit by bit by bit by bit. And as the day of the operation approached, she wasn't sure she wanted to go through it. She went back to the doctor who did a repeat laparoscopy. And looked into her abdomen, and then sent her into the waiting room. Oops, was it something I said? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> sent her into the waiting room, and the, the gynecologist went out to talk to her husband. And he said, this is really remarkable. Her endometriosis is practically gone. And her husband said, you know, she went on a completely vegan diet, and she has been feeling better and better and better just week by week. And the, the doctor said, no, 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 no. Foods don't cause endometriosis, and there is no way a diet change could ever make it go away. There's only one explanation. This is a miracle. <laughs> so this was apparently coded on her medical record um, as miracle. And so she lost a lot of weight. She feels a lot better. Um, Catherine now has three kids, never had the operation at all. She joined us as a Food for Life instructor, and now she's telling other women how they can get their bodies back and hopefully not have surgery. Okay, so, no, wait a minute. I was, this is a hormone-related condition, right? And I'm talking about hormones in cheese? Okay, think about this. Cows don't produce milk. No, no, an, no animal produces milk until the animal has gotten pregnant and gives birth, right? So to keep the milk production high, the dairy farmers impregnate the cows every, not personally, they impregnate the, the, the cows every year. Um, and so a cow's gestation is about nine months, similar to a, a human. So nine months out of 12, they're pregnant. Pregnant cows make estrogen. It's a match for your estrogen. It gets into the plasma, there it is, especially as the cow comes to term. But then it goes into the milk in a little more concentrated form, and it's only a trace, it's not much. However, researchers in Rochester, New York, went into a fertility clinic and they started doing sperm counts on various men. And they found this remarkable thing, that the men who consumed the most cheese, that's the red group, had the worst sperm counts. Um, not just low counts, but low uh, motility and odd morphology. So the, the, their theory was, it's only a trace of hormones, but what if a man has all the female hormones he wants to have, and you start giving him little bits of extra? Could that actually affect something like fertility? Hold that thought. Researchers in California looked at something a little bit more important, women who had had breast cancer. If you've had breast cancer and you were treated for it, you got one thing on your mind. Is my cancer gonna come back at some point? And it turned out that those women who consumed the most high-fat dairy, that's butter and cheese, that's the group on the right, they had a 49% higher risk of dying of their breast cancer compared to the women who tended to avoid it. 
Now the difference here is very small. The high group was more than one serving a day. The low group was less than half a serving a day. So these researchers said the same thing as the people in Rochester. Could it be that the traces of hormones in dairy products could actually affect a woman's chemistry? Now, I'm quite prepared to believe that the amounts are just small. However, when milk is turned to cheese, the hormones go with the fat. Remember, cheese is 70% fat? The average American consumes 35 pounds of it last year, this year, and next year. And your body is already making all the hormones that you are supposed to have, so to speak. And if I'm adding a little bit more, it could be there is no threshold. So, the scientists are still sorting this out. We don't really know where this science is going to go. But in, while they're figuring it out, do you want to feed this to your six-year-old son, your seven-year-old daughter, your wife, your husband? Um, that's the question that people are now asking based on this work. Okay. Now, it's not just the fat and the hormones. Um, there's something about the protein. Uh, this is Chad. Chad grew up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, right on the water, and he was an athletic young boy, except that Chad could not get through a ball game because he had asthma. And asthma can be exercise-induced, so right about the third inning, he'd be coughing and wheezing and, and, and couldn't play anymore. If he would go over to a friend's house and they had a dog, he would get... Uh, uh, allergy-induced asthma, and he had to be hospitalized repeatedly. And when he was 18, he had heard somewhere that vegan diets, and especially getting away from dairy in particular, could make asthma go away. Though many of you know about this already. It's the protein they're keying in on, not the fat. He said, I'll try this. Went vegan within three months. No more asthma. No more allergies. And he's now got his, his own dog, and he's, got, and he's raising his family, to, and nobody has asthma. Now, we don't re I, I don't think we know enough about this, but what seems to be happening is it's not that you're allergic to the milk, but somehow milk makes other allergies worse. So you've got a cat allergy, and you get itchy eyes from your cat, and when you get the dairy out of your diet, somehow you can pet your cat again, and I don't think anyone knows quite why that works. So there's Chad now. He's um, allergy-free, asthma-free, and he runs, you know Ruby, the online cooking school? He runs the plant-based section of that. So. All right, so this raises the scientific question. Could dairy products contribute to asthma? I don't know. Let's have a look. Let's Google this, shall we? Uh, I'm going to type it in. There's asthma dairy. Let's see what I come up with. Okay, there it is. The first thing I find is National Asthma Council Australia, and right on their homepage, they tackle this directly. Dairy foods have often been, aha, dairy foods have often been suggested as a common trigger for asthma. Hmm. But there's little scientific evidence to support this myth. Unfortunately, most Australians are missing out on the health benefits that come from consuming milk, cheese, and yogurt as they don't consume enough dairy foods. And wait, this is starting to smell a little funny, isn't it? Let's go back. I want to click on their sponsors page. There it is. Uh -huh. OK, so there's Dairy Australia and five drug companies. So. One of these outfits makes money if you buy dairy and cheese. The other make money if you have asthma. Nobody gets any money if you get better or stop eating dairy products, okay? So, don't wait for the research to be finished. If you have a child with asthma, if you have allergies, run, don't walk to a dairy-free diet. It's not going to cure everybody, but it's a good place to start. Okay, the next thing I want to tackle, if you don't mind, I've written a number of books, and up until this one, I always focused on the health part of it. But for the cheese trap, I was really struck by parts of the, the animal part of it that I was unaware of. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share that with you. Um, the United Nations makes manuals for low literacy populations involved in agriculture. And so they have this dairy farming manual on how you can artificially inseminate your, your dairy buffaloes and cattle so that you can get milk. And these are not my pictures, these are United Nations pictures. But I want to show you this process. Um, this cow is about to get artificially inseminated. Again, this is the United Nations guide on how to do it. What you do is you take a glove and you put it on your left hand all the way up to your shoulder. And you put your left hand into the cow's rectum and past your elbow and then you can feel through the rectal wall, you can feel the uterus and you hold it still. 
And with your right hand, you take what looks like a knitting needle and you put it through the cervix and inject semen that you took from a bull. And by the way, these animals are not volunteers, um, but they are not going to object. She is chained by the neck. Um, this is the way it looks. Um, and when she has been impregnated, whether she wanted this or not, you then write the date on her flank because she's going to have a baby. And nine months pass. And she does have a baby. And regardless of how she got pregnant, this is her baby. And the baby is in the hay in front of her. And the baby blinks his eyes or her eyes and looks up at mom and she looks down at her baby and she starts to lick the baby and clean the baby up and you can see this bonding happening. And the farmer looks on and thinks, this always gets me. This is really something to see. Except the farmer then knows right away that if he allows this to proceed, he's out of business because that milk cannot go to that baby. The milk's got to go into a pail and be sold. So the farmer has an implement that takes care of this problem every single time. It's called a wheelbarrow. Um, you take the calf and pick the calf up and you put her or him in the wheelbarrow and you walk away. Now there is no stronger bond in nature than that between a mother and her baby. And it doesn't matter what species you are. She objects and she follows and she nudges him and she pushes and she follows him all the way until a gate slams in her face and her baby goes off around the corner. And she stands in that spot and she calls out all night long. And the baby goes into a hutch like this. Now, if he's, if he's a he, he's not going to stay alive. He's going to be sold for veal because a dairy herd has no use for him. And you know about how, how veal calves are kept and there's no civilized person who would eat veal. But if the calf is female, she has a future with the dairy herd, which is that she will be fed milk replacer. She will never see her mother again, but she'll be fed milk replacer, and she's going to be dehorned. Uh, you don't want horns. Uh, if you get her early enough, you could just scoop the horns right out of the skull with a process called disbudding. Um, any veterinarian who's ever done this will never do it a second time. It's a very bloody procedure that the calves are not keen on, um, and you do it very quick uh, without anesthesia, typically. Um, then what happens is, at some point, well, let me read this to you first. Um, I saw this when I was writing this book. I came across this newspaper article from Newburyport, Massachusetts. Strange noises coming from the high road near Sunshine Dairy Farm Monday night and into yesterday morning prompted local police to alert residents that there's nothing spooky or scary going on. According to Newberry Police Sergeant Patty Fisher, the noises are coming from mother cows who are lamenting the separation from their calves. It happens every year at the same time. So you can't run a dairy farm without it. Now, around age four, when the cow is four, she's been impregnated every year and her calves are taken away from her, the farmer does the math and says, I'm not getting enough milk out of you for what I'm feeding you. And the farmer decides that if he puts her on a truck and slaughters her for beef and puts her daughter in the stall where she was, you get more milk per unit feed. And that's the way the dairy industry works. Uh, about 200,000 dairy cows are killed every single month. They're all killed. The lifespan of a cow is 20 years, give or take. Um, on dairy farms, it's four, because they're just not worth it anymore. So the, the dairy industry is a meat industry. But I have to impregnate you every single year, make you go through the separation from your calves, make them take your place when you get slaughtered, and we go through this cycle over and over and over again. That's creepy. There's something I can eat instead? Is there? There's a lot you can eat instead. Okay, so instead of feta on my salad, why not put some avocado chunks on there? It has a nice mouth feel. It's really great. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, anybody been there? Seeing the movie, right? Um, we knew about grilled cheese sandwiches, but I never heard of this hummus, humus, what is this thing that Middle Eastern people all know about? And suddenly that's kind of taken its place. You don't need that grilled cheese anymore. I can go to the store and they've got this pizza, but right next to it is that pizza with no cheese whatsoever. Or I can make my own pizza, a vegan pizza. And anybody use nutritional yeast? Um, the, the, you have to kind of elbow your way past the bodybuilders because it's sold in the supplement aisle. But it happens to have a cheesy flavor with no fat at all. And you can put it on pizzas, in sauces, in chilies, in soups, and all kinds of stuff. 
And has anybody made a, a ricotta with tofu? You ever do, do you ever do that? And you feed it to your friends, and they will swear to you that this is actual cheese. But it, you know, it, it works really, really, really well. So there's all kinds of things. Uh, you, there's Kite Hill brand cheese, which comes out of San Francisco. It's, it's exactly a cheese-making process, except they start with almond milk instead of dairy milk. Fair enough. You don't have to impregnate an almond, right? Um, <laughs> There's tree-line cheese, which is made from cashews. Cashews don't have hormones in them. It's fair enough. Uh, have, have you ever had Miyoko's cheese? If you get a chance, you got to order this online. It is a work of art. It comes wrapped in a fig leaf. It's, it's a cashew cheese, Miyoko, M-I-Y-O-K-O, -O, Miyoko, Miyoko's Kitchen, San Francisco. She also has one that's wrapped in the black ash of a Mediterranean pine. And Miyoko will say, this is not a food group, this is a little nibble food. This is a, something to just have little bits of on special occasions. So all of these things are there. And so I wrote this book called The Cheese Trap, but I want to do a shout out to Drina Burton. Do you know Drina? Drina does recipes. And so she and I have been collaborating on this, and she will make you a bang up fabulous cheesecake with no cheese, a fettuccine Alfredo, all the things where cheese would be a, a part with none of it at all. Um, so there's no excuse. We can really have fun and have health at the same time. Getting away from cheese isn't something sad or where you're going to feel deprived. It's an adventure because the things that replace it are a whole lot more cool than the cheese itself. And suddenly your environmental friends and your vegan friends and your health care provider is now saying this is the best thing you ever did. Okay, so if you don't mind, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, this is an MR spectroscopy machine. And in our laboratory, we do lots and lots and lots of research studies, and we measure things in people's bodies as they go vegan, and it is amazing to see people reclaim their health. They come into our research studies, they lose weight, their cholesterol levels fall, uh, their energy gets better, their diabetes improves, sometimes it goes away. I'm just remarkable results, and many of you have seen this too, right? Um, however, not uncommonly, I hear people say something like, yeah, I lost weight, I feel so great, but sometimes I just really miss cheese, or, or I miss sugar, or I miss junk food. You know what I'm talking about? What, what is going on? Is it the sugar? Is it the salt? Is it those casomorphins? What is it? I'm going to argue it's dopamine. Dopamine. Do you know dopamine? Dopamine is the brain chemical, the reward chemical in the brain. It comes out of one cell. There it is. It's those little black dots going and attaching to those receptors. And when it hits the receptor, it propagates a happy feeling. Why did nature stick that in your brain? The reason is it rewards you for finding a receptive mate or a healthy food source. However, unfortunately, it can be shanghaied by drugs, alcohol, tobacco, all of these things trigger dopamine and that's why people get addicted. But junk food does it too. So the reason people go to the refrigerator at 9.30 at night is not that they're hungry or they are magnesium deficient or any of that stuff. They are looking for a dopamine hit whether they know it or not. And that can then mean we gain weight and we get diabetes and we get high cholesterol because of our unknowing search for dopamine. Well, are there healthy dopamine sources? Yes, there are. That's the good thing. So when we're around our friends and our family, we get a little bit of dopamine. And if it's an intimate encounter and it's a very close friendship or, or a love relationship, you get more and more and more dopamine. This is the brain rewarding you for what it thinks is going to propagate the species. Um, physical activity provides dopamine too which is great. And you can combine these two. You go to your Zumba class and you get physical activity and you also get, get the company of other people. But there's a third
Now, the question is, can music actually act as medicine? Well, researchers went into the labor and delivery suite, and they asked women during the birth process to rate their pain. And their pain increased toward giving birth. They then did the experiment again, and they gave them a little bit of a massage continuously during the entire process, and they rated their pain less. They then did the experiment a third time, no massage, but just music. They, they pre-selected, and what they discovered is music works as a painkiller about as effectively as a continual massage. So, the question is, what can music actually do? Let's put it to the test. We're going to compare Beethoven to Velveeta. We're going to take a two-ounce serving of each one. Calories, fat, cholesterol, sodium. I got to tell you, Beethoven is wiping the floor with Velveeta all the way through. As a matter of fact, I've looked at every one of the symphonies. A little louder, this is Ludwig von Beethoven. Every symphony, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. You add it all up. Zero cholesterol. Not in any of them. That's right. Okay, so could Beethoven compete with something like chocolate? Well, I don't know. You know, our taste buds are really designed for simple stuff like apples and not really for things like M&Ms. Um, even so, if I'm alone and chocolate is calling your name, well, if you're surrounded by friends, that's less likely to happen. If you're sedentary versus a person who's active, you've got a little more strength if you're active. If you're living in silence versus a person who's enjoying music and art, Healthy dopamine sources give you a little bit of an edge over those addictive foods. So I wanted to, if you don't mind, share with you my own personal dopamine source. Um, when I was a little kid growing up in Fargo, my parents had the idea that any civilized person should play the piano and one other instrument. So I was chained to my instruments all, the, all during my childhood. Wasn't allowed to go to school until I'd done my lessons. And I stuck with it um, all the way through medicine, uh, medical school and residency. And this is my current band which is called Carbon Works, and thank you. And uh, let me brag a little bit, actually. Um, there we are on the top 40 list a couple of weeks ago, um, and as you'll notice, we're above Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus um, with a song called Louder Than Words. If you don't mind, I'm gonna play you two of our songs really quick, and those of you who have a little bit of an animal focus, um, the second song is about a little girl who is an animal person, and she's got her stuffed animals all around her, but she wakes up, and there's the rock and roll band in her bedroom. And the uh, guitarist in the band gives her a sword and turns her into a samurai and she can break the chains to free her animal friends. And before that, I want to uh, show you a, a video of, of a song that I wrote um, all about kind of animals and who they might be on the inside. So turn up the volume a little bit and let me share this with you.
in her pockets with clovers and bits of the moon. The last thing I just want to say is thank you to Paul for all the fantastic work that he does. Uh, thank you to Joel Kahn, Carolyn Trapp, everybody who's made this tremendous um, effort here in Detroit. You are a role model for every other city to follow. So thank you for letting me be part of this tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good luck with all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. Thank you. All right, we're going to do a little bit of uh, questions and answers, so let's start. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay, I knew we'd start. Okay, here we go. This isn't a question, but I was in Chicago yesterday, Monday, and my daughter-in-law is from Wisconsin. And I told her I was coming here, and she said, evidently, you don't know my people. <laughs> I'm with you. Yes, go ahead. Hi, doctor. Um, so I have a quick question. I have a 14-month-old daughter, and I'm trying to raise her vegan, but She's kind of a picky eater, so mostly vegetarian at the moment. And my question is, oh, she, she has also a nut allergy. So what is the best way to proceed with that? And also, I know when watching What the Health, I heard that feeding infants and toddlers milk is not good, but I really don't know what else to feed her as opposed to... Oh, okay, well, first of all, she's lucky to have you for a mom because you're, you're concerned about this, that's for sure. Um, and how, how old is your daughter? She's 14 months. Okay, well, you're in charge. Um, that's the first thing that has to be said. You're the mom and she's not shopping or anything, which is great. Um, and so obviously up until that age, kids can have breast milk. And even at that age, it, it can continue or not. That's um, up to you, obviously. Um, but then as solid foods are added, there's no need ever to introduce um, cow's milk of, of any kind or any kind of animal milk at all. Um, and kids do better without it. And then the solid foods can come in bit by bit, um, and there's just never a need to, to introduce animal products of any kind. But you'll wanna make sure that she has healthy foods and get, make sure she gets B12, 
That's important. You want to stick with your pedi don't fire your pediatrician. Um, but a plant-based diet is great for kids, and kids are picky. Um, but you'll try different things, and you'll find the, you'll find the things that, that she likes. There's never a need to introduce the animal products. And again, she's lucky to have you. Hi, hi. I tried the plant-based nutrition, but it affected my blood pressure even more. I already have low blood pressure, 95 over 54, but it's bringing it down into the 80s. Yeah, so it is, you're setting new records for low blood pressure right there. <laughs> but I feel it. I notice it now when it's in the 80s, so now it's, it's kind of a problem. So I have some arthritis going on, so I have to be careful with the salt because that causes more arthritis. Pain. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I don't really know what to say. First of all, you're the envy of everybody else who's tired of blood pressure pills because, because they got high blood pressure, they're trying to bring it down. You've got the opposite situation where you have a healthy and fairly low blood pressure that's, that's not, it's not dangerous to have borderline low blood pressure except you stand up quickly and you feel lightheaded and that kind of thing. So um, the only suggestion I would have is obviously you want to work with your doctor to see if there's any uh, underlying issue, which you probably have already been doing, um, and then make sure you eat an adequate amount of food, get regular exercise, because exercise kind of helps the body to set the blood pressure. Typically, for most people, it brings it down, but it helps keep it in gear, and beyond that, it's, it's really between you and your doctor to sort out. So, yeah, good luck. Um, where were we? Uh, hi, doctor. Would you briefly ad address uh, osteoporosis in men, specifically the vegan diet, losing weight, uh, getting older? Um, and then being diagnosed with osteoporosis as a result. Yeah, osteoporosis means, um, as everybody knows, the, the bones are thinning, and the usual thing that people think of is calcium, and, and it's true, you do need calcium, but um, the cow doesn't make calcium. So, so the doctors who say you should drink milk, there is calcium in milk, but the cow didn't make it. The cow, the cow ate calcium in plants. In the green, green leafy vegetables have a lot of calcium, so the cow eats grass and that calcium gets into the milk. If, if we eat, not grass, but broccoli, kale, collards, Brussels sprouts, that's our source of, of calcium. So you do need that, um, but there's obviously more to it. You need to be able to absorb it, and that's where vitamin D comes in, which normally comes from the sun. And if you're not getting much sun, then a supplement is good up to about 2,000 international units a day. And if the doctor tests you as low, you could supplement higher than that. Physical exercise is really important at any age. Um, true for kids and it's true for older folks. So physical activity has got to be a big part of it. And that's kind of the, the recipe um, for strong bones. There are some people who will say, I wouldn't worry too much about it because it's normal to have some give in the bones and they don't worry a lot about osteoporosis. Personally, I do take it seriously. Um, I think it is good to keep an eye on, but not a reason to return dairy to the diet, obviously. But it's important to have a good mineral-rich diet with the greens and beans especially. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, my name is Rick. Been a fan of yours forever. Uh, you've been on my bucket list to meet. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. And I, I really I'm appreciate glad that you all the work that you've done in all these years. I just had a question. Um, do you know if there's any studies uh, concerning uh, relationship between plant-based diet and aplastic anemia? That's a fascinating question. I don't know. Joel, I'm looking at you. I don't, I have not heard of that. Carolyn, I would, I would say no. Okay. Um, there are other kinds of anemia, of course, like iron deficiency anemia if you're not getting iron, mm -hmm. or you can, you can get low B12. These, these things are easy to, relatively easy to diagnose and relatively easy to treat. But for aplastic anemia, I would think no. Now I'm going to have to read the, on this tonight and see if I come up with something. But no, I have not heard of that. Okay. Anyway, thank you for letting me know that, and I'm going to think about that. Well, if you find it, I'll I give will you let my you know. email address and, and let me know. Okay, what you find. good, great right, question. Thank you. thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. I? John Pullman, a dermatologist in Clinton Township. I wanted to thank you again for the you know great body of work that you put out, and I want to tell you it's had a tremendous impact on the way that I treat my patients, and uh, wanted to give you that appreciation. Thank you. They're lucky to have you. Uh, thank you. In uh, your slides, uh, when you're looking at, you know, the mechanism of action of breast cancer association with dairy, you know, you focused quite a bit on estradiol. 
And I'd like to point out that, you know, uh, any kind of consumption of dairy cheese also increases IGF-1 produced by your own body. And, and there are many other mechanisms of action. Uh, so when you say, ah, this, these picograms of estradiol, you know, we don't want to think in a reductionistic way, you know, as, as some of our colleagues would think. You know, there are many different reasons. And uh, uh, you, might, you might also mention that just as it's not the only mechanism of action because, well, anyways, that's just sort of a little bit of feedback. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, let me agree with you. You're, you're absolutely right. In fact, I would go a little bit further that I picked on estradiol, but you can look at estradiol, free estradiol, and other estrogen fractions, and they are all in the milk, and they all go up. And I just picked that one to be simple um, because it's one that people know about, but you're absolutely right. And, and then the IGF-1, if people are not aware of what he was talking about, um, animal milks have something called insulin-like growth factor in them, IGF-1, and it's a growth factor. It makes things grow. And that's a good thing if you're a calf and you're growing, but it's a bad thing if you're a cancer cell in a man's prostate um, because IGF-1 makes it grow. Um, and if you inject the cow with bovine growth hormone, there's more IGF-1 in, in, in the, the milk and so forth. But um, the big thing I don't think is the IGF-1 in the milk. It's the milk itself, this cocktail. I know you know where I'm going with this. The mixture of protein and sugar that is this milky cocktail causes the human body to make extra IGF-1. And we believe that that is one of the reasons why you see cancer cells growing. So you're absolutely right. So anyway, thanks for so raising that. Just as a mnemonic that's helped me remember this, I, I try to remember milk, it grows a cancer good. Yeah. <laughs> I can finally see the ads right now. Great, unless, thank you for sharing that. If you're I'm allowed, you're absolutely one right. Suggestion. If, if next time uh, you bring your guitar, you could guitar along to your own video. I, I think I, I, I think Only if you join me. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Only if you join me. Great, thank you. Uh, time for a couple more questions and then we'll uh, stop. Yes, Neil, please. hi, Bob Brakey from Ann Arbor Family Hey, Doc. good to see you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw your talk, uh, same one, uh, last week in D.C. Thank you. You're always an inspiration. Uh, oh, I, you. too, use your handouts uh, every day with my patients. Um, you mentioned that in the cheese-making process, the whey is kind of a, a pushed aside. It's a byproduct. So the industry has learned how to put this into a protein drink, push for, for athletes. Is this really a, a, a health food for them now or a byproduct that they should avoid. Oh, isn't it the most amazing thing? Whey was thrown into landfills. They were, it, it was a big problem because you had a cheese factory and you don't use the whey for anything. And so um, the neighbors would complain and it was a big issue. What do you do with all this whey? And so they figured out if you desiccate it and put it in a, a can and you have an ad with a guy with muscles on it and you, um, and you fund some studies showing that it somehow causes a magical effect, people will pay a lot of money for your garbage. And it's, that's what's happened. And it's, it's really marketing. Um, more recently, the dairy industry is doing a similar thing with chocolate milk. Have you seen this? If you've got high school kids who are in, ath in athletics, it's the best thing, the best recovery drink is chocolate milk. The very thing that's been pushed out of high schools, they're now saying, no, no, it's got the sugar that kids need, it's got the protein, and it's, I gotta tell you, marketing is an amazing force. Okay, where are we? Okay, yeah, uh, time for two last questions? Very good, sure. Okay, good. Thank you, Doctor, I pre love your lecture. Oh, thank you. So I am, um, the grandmother of five children under five. And my kids are, my sons are both physicians, so we're not far from this world. And they've moved around with their residencies and fellowships and you know the, you know the, the routine. And they've had many different pediatricians. Every single pediatrician tells, my, my daughter-in-laws usually, that it, how important it is for these kids to drink milk. Why isn't this in the, in, the, uh, in the educational system of physicians to not, to not push this? Uh, yeah, let's all pause and take an antidepressant. Um, um, it's, it really is true, unfortunately, that, um, and this is true in medical school, and Carolyn, isn't this true in nursing school too? It's also, it's even a little true in dietetic school sometimes, that you really don't learn the nutrition that counts. 
Um, and so a doctor who has really had very little nutritional training, and when they get it, Joel, tell me if this is right, they show you the vitamin C structure and they tell you a story about sailors getting scurvy, but they don't tell you anything about how to raise a healthy kid um, and, the, 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 and the role of nutrition. But the doctor read in a magazine somewhere while he was at the pool that kids really need milk, and so that's what he's telling you. Um, and it really needs to go further than that because science has clearly shown a number of things. That dairy is one of the chief suspects in the autoimmune process that triggers type 1 diabetes. Big cause of allergies, big cause of, as we talked about asthma. Um, and many autoimmune conditions and sensitivities that may or may not be autoimmune like migraine and whatever. Plus the fact you just don't need it at all. Um, my hope is that that will change. At the Physicians Committee, we're arguing very strongly for uh, nutrition in medical schools. We, we have a book called The Nutrition Guide for Clinicians, which we give free of charge to every medical student in the United States. And we're now working on the third edition of it. We have curricula, uh, we have continuing medical education credits, and as you were talking earlier, we have a, a uh, conference every year, which we just had last weekend, we had 700 doctors and medical students come. So, so things are not so hot right now, but we're working really hard to try to get the information out there. And I'm optimistic um, for, for two reasons. The first is there are a lot of doctors going in a good direction now. And the second thing is there are so many patients who are insisting on it and are educating their doctors in turn. So I'm, I think that... Um, things are going to change for the better. At least I hope so. so. Uh, one last question. Where are we? Okay. Hello? Um, yes. I actually, there were a couple of things I noticed in your book um, that there were, there, it looks like a lot of the recipes are very like nut-centric, lots of cashews, and I think some of the stories had a lot of people eating with oil in their diets, and especially for someone like me who am working on obesity, um, how you feel uh, that is that works into a plant-based diet, is that still good to do? And also, um, if there's any research on plant-based diets assisting in any way with osteoarthritis. Okay, um, first of all, with osteoarthritis, you would think no, you would think diet wouldn't have anything to, would not have anything to do with it. Because osteoarthritis is the wear and tear arthritis. That said, um, you do seem to see diet, ish, diet changes. The, the, the simple one is that when people lose weight, the pressure is less on their knees, and so there's less, um, less risk of, of developing osteoarthritis changes in the knees. But even the, for reasons I can't explain, even in the fingers um, and other areas where the weight shouldn't make any difference, you see uh, improvements and reductions in osteoarthritis. Um, with regard to the recipes, when I was working with Drina, I wanted some recipes that were really healthy that you would never have to apologize to uh, about at all. Uh, but I also asked that we include some cheese methadone in there. Um, meaning, <laughs> if you have a friend who loves a really fatty cheese and you're trying to lure them away, I wanted to have some recipes like that in there. So um, if you're trying to lose weight or deal with diabetes or something like that, stick with the ones that follow the guidelines, which we've talked about a lot, which is keep the fat really low. But the choices are there, and you're going to hopefully see the ones that really work the best for you. Okay, let me um, stop at that point. Thank you again, Paul. Thanks to all of you for doing what you do. Thanks a million. Thank you.